started this morning. I usually say it's a pleasure to introduce somebody, but uh, now I'm not so sure. Um, Dr. Van Sickle is an associate professor in the Department of Surgery uh, in general and laparoscopic surgery, uh, and has been on the faculty seven years, Too six? Long, yes. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it kind of wears on us. And uh, this morning he's going to be talking about uh, the medical and surgical treatment of gastroparesis. Uh, Dr. Van Sickle grew up in Tennessee, uh, went to undergraduate at the University of Tennessee. Yeah, he likes to refer to it as the other UT. Uh, and uh, went to medical school at Memphis at the University. Uh, did his uh, general surgery residency uh, in uh, Atlanta. Uh, then was out in private practice for four years in Carolina, South Carolina. And then saw the light that uh, he thought he would need to go ahead and advance his skills, and so he did a laparoscopic fellowship uh, at Emory uh, with Dan Smith. And after completing that, we were able and quite lucky to go ahead and recruit him to join us here on the faculty uh, this morning. Uh, will you please welcome Dr. Van Sickle. Okay, good morning, and happy Halloween. Now, can I work the room once? Hey, what happened to my laptop? Somebody took my laptop away. <laughs> no, I loaded up my laptop. Someone played trick or treat on me. Where did the uh, where did the laptop go? Seriously, I have my laptop and now it's missing. <laughs> where did the IT guy go? Did you disconnect the laptop? All right. Well, I have a backup. Always carry back up, right? <laughs> Someone literally walked off with it, I think. Unless they disconnected it. Okay. Right here, loaded up and ready. We will fix that after you come. All right, are we loaded? <laughs> Everyone hear me? All right, I have an hourglass sign here. That looks like it's on. Okay all that. We'll get started. All right, well, thank you and happy Halloween. Uh, today we're going to talk about gastroparesis. Uh, let me get rid of that. So, as uh, Dr. Serenic mentioned, uh, this is a talk on gastroparesis and the medical and surgical management uh, of what I think has largely been considered uh, a medical disease, uh, at least until recently. Uh, we'll talk about some of the physiology of gastric emptying, uh, the workup and, and to some extent the medications used to treat this disease, uh, but obviously as surgeons are more interested in focusing on what we, what we can do about it. So we'll talk some about the endoscopic uh, and surgical procedures and hopefully at the end have time for some questions and answers. Well, as my outrageous costume would suggest, and for those of you who aren't paying attention, today's Halloween. Uh, and I'm not sure if this is deliberately staged by Dr. Stewart to have me give the talk on Halloween or actually, <laughs> truthfully, I just volunteered. Um, so uh, it originates from the Celtic festival of, don't ask me to pronounce this, but I think it's Sahuin, which means summer's end. So it's basically the end of the harvest season. Uh, and uh, that's where it originates back in the uh, Middle Ages. And Halloween, the term, is a Catholic term referring to All Hallows' Eve, uh, preceding All Saints' Day, which is November 1st. Uh, which is also Dia de las Muertas for those who speak Spanish. I'm not one of them, but uh, that's also what it celebrates. And trick-or-treating, uh, derived from going door-to-door -door in the Middle Ages, uh, exchanging gifts for the dead. 
uh, called souling, and then dressing up and going door to door uh, has origins back that far as well. So in this uh, spirit, someone else stole, they stole my candy too. I brought a Halloween pet pumpkin full of candy. I was going to throw out to people. Well, I've been sabotaged, obviously. So, uh, all right. So, anyone want to know the meaning of the word hallow in relation to this holiday? Anyone want to get the Veronica got it? Saint. There you go. So, she gets a piece of candy when I get back to my office. Uh, gastroparesis. So, the definition of gastroparesis is uh, delayed gastric emptying uh, in the absence of mechanical obstruction. Uh, basically is characterized by chronic nausea and vomiting. Uh, I can't express to you how ill and just miserable these patients are. You see them in the hospital acutely with bowel obstructions and things of that nature, but these patients essentially have what is a uh, physiologic bowel obstruction every day of their life. Um, and so they fill up immediately, and, and not surprisingly, they constantly have that feeling of fullness. Uh, and such that chronic abdominal pain is a common. These patients are often on narcotics, um, and they're very difficult to wean off the narcotics, both before, during, and after treatment. Uh, a lot of uh, psychiatric illnesses are associated with the disorder. The chicken or the egg, we're not sure which comes first, whether you go nuts from puking every day or whether you start puking every day because you're nuts, but there's a lot of psych uh, psychiatric disasters associated with it. Uh, and not surprisingly, the consequences are what you would probably expect for someone that can't eat. Um, this is just a, a longitudinal study of, uh, I think it was Olmstead County in Minnesota, uh, where they just tried to examine uh, the etiology, the background behind gastroparesis uh, of a fixed population over a period of time. And so they came up with rough estimates of what most of us uh, in medicine sort of allude to when we're looking at the different types of gastroparesis and what their etiologies are. Uh, idiopathic in this particular study was the most frequent, followed very closely by diabetes, uh, although it's certainly regional. I think here in San Antonio, it's probably more likely the, the converse, uh, as it were more like, likely to have diabetic gastroparesis than idiopathics. Uh, but by and large, those are your two largest causes for gastroparesis. Uh, shamefully, but uh, frankly not surprisingly, the third most common is post-surgical, either intended or unintended, uh, with uh, purposeful truncal vagotomies and peptic ulcer disease or incidental vagotomies uh, as part of foregut surgery. Uh, and then there's sort of all the others, Parkinson's and neurologic disorders, uh, and uh, something referred to as pseudo-obstruction, which we don't see as surgeons. Uh, and so the epidemiology of this disease, uh, it's increasing. The overall incidence, 24 per 100,000 uh, and it's far more common in women, in women, excuse me. So the field of female to male ratio is uh, uh, four to one. And uh, that's certainly what I've seen in my, my clinical practice is it's really unusual to treat a male with this disorder, more commonly female. Uh, and as, again, the incidence of this disorder is uh, increasing, I think largely due to the morbid obesity epidemic. We're having more problems with diabetes. Uh, and sort of one of the more paradoxical things that I'm seeing is the morbidly obese patient with gastroparesis. Really makes no sense at all when you think about it, but uh, it, it is an entity. It's a phenomenon. It's out there. So in type 1, it's uh, a little bit more common uh, because it's largely considered to be a form of uh, neuropathy. In essence, it's like a gastric neuropathy. So as you might imagine, the longer you have diabetes, the more likely that demyelination process is to occur. Uh, but post-surgical, we're certainly seeing a little spike in that, I think a little bit uh, from foregut surgery primarily. Uh, and again, idiopathics are another increasing subgroup. We're not exactly sure why, but it's following the trend. So uh, in diabetics, it sort of depends on your source. Uh, some studies will cite that there's up, a 50, up to a 50% incidence uh, of symptoms in patients with long-standing type 1 uh, and even more type 2 diabetics with poorly controlled blood sugars will have symptoms. And, and that's not surprising. Uh, we'll go into briefly some of the physiology of gastric emptying, but most of us know that hyperglycemia is associated with gastric stasis for uh, various mechanisms. So it makes sense that patients with poorly controlled blood sugars are more likely to have emptying problems. It's sort of a, a vicious cycle. They get hyperglycemic and their stomach goes paretic and they can't empty and their sugars get harder and harder to control. So uh, again, it's typically a late manifestation. Uh, again, sort of a gastric neuropathy. Oh, you found it. Thank you. Uh, 
the next person who gets a question right, you'll get a piece of candy at the end of the show. So it gets a, gets a uh, piece of candy. Uh, so the, the classic triad or triopathy, retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy, it, it's a, it basically considered to be along those lines of a gastric neuropathy, like I had mentioned. Uh, and there are other sort of uh, pathophysiologic variables at play um, that can also contribute to the, the reasons diabetics get stuck with this problem. So again, idiopathics, whether you think they're the largest or the second largest subgroup, they're very uh, important in terms of the breakdown. Uh, again, the true cause not known, hence the term idiopathic. Uh, and in some of these patients I've seen, they can get into episodes where they literally go into remission, where their sympt symptoms basically go away for no reason other, or maybe better diet control and some medication effect, but then they're prone to relapse. That's sort of the nature of the disease anyway, uh, and sort of these episodic times where they're coming out of the ER five to ten times a month. Uh, but in some of the idiopathics, they can remiss for, for months or even years at a time. Uh, and again, the post-surgical group, uh, after vagotomy, um, obviously it usually requires an emptying procedure, uh, but in association with emptying, there's also a failure of the receptive relaxation part of the fundus uh, that sort of mitigates the volume in the stomach. Uh, and then the same thing with post-fundos. Post uh, after using the fundus to wrap around the esophagus to reflux, uh, again, you're altering the ability of that fundus to fully relax in some cases. Uh, and I've seen personally and certainly read plenty of reports about incidental vagus nerves injury during lap parasophageal hernias and nissens. So working up a patient with, uh, with gastroparesis, other than the obvious history and physical, uh, it, they usually come to us uh, sort of surgeons or proceduralists after most of the medical workup and diagnosis and therapy has occurred. But uh, just for the students and residents of the room, so essentially you have to rule out obstruction, otherwise it's not gastroparesis, you have some other problem, right? So the, the typical common sense workup items for uh, ruling out gastric obstruction EGD, barium swallow, CT scan. Uh, here on this CT scan, uh, you can see, clearly see full contrast in food, barium swallow with a giant outline of food there. And here's what you typically see, though, on upper endoscopy is bits of retained food in the stomach. And if you think about it, if they truly have gone on an overnight fast, even if you're doing EGD at 8 o'clock in the morning, there shouldn't be anything in there. Uh, the stomach usually empties in most normals, uh, with certainly within one to two hours, but less than 10% is supposed to be present in the stomach at four hours. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, and again, you correlate those findings with your clinical symptoms. If they have the classic sort of chronic nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, uh, and all the other ones I described earlier, uh, those are strongly suggestive, but in essence, you really have to have a gastric emptying study to clearly uh, identify the disorder and make your diagnosis. So the gastric emptying scan, uh, or what's sad, I guess, in some cases, is that uh, GES is the abbreviation used for gastric emptying scan. It's also the abbreviation used for the gastric electrical stimulator, which I'll talk about in a minute. But in any event, uh, the gastric emptying scan is required at this point for diagnosis. It's the gold standard for evaluating and uh, diagnosing someone with uh, gastroparesis. And so what the NukeMed gastric emptying scan does is it quantifies emptying of the stomach uh, much more objectively than the subjective type of history that you're going to get from your patient. So uh, here's an example. Here's a snapshot of uh, uh, nuclear medicine uh, technetium-99 scintigraphy. So on the top are nor is a normal subject here where you can see at one hour, or excuse me, at, at baseline, the, the stomach is full of isotope. And here you start to see it empty and appear into the small intestine, almost completely out of the stomach. And at four hours, there's basically nothing there, almost nothing. And the majority of it's distally in the bowel. But here's an abnormal or typical gastroparetic subject on the bottom, where you can see the radionucleotide basically just sitting in the stomach. Uh, and even at the three hour, 180 minute, three hour film, there's still plenty of uh, isotope left in the stomach. Again, it's affected by multiple variables, um, age, uh, gender, BMI, and again, glucose control. So, for example, in our institution, uh, the attempt is to standardize that you are actually doing AccuCheck's at baseline, at one hour, at two hour, and three hour, and four hour, to see if you can correlate their active blood sugars with their emptying. And that's considered sort of the universal standard. Uh, I was not aware that there was a Joint Society of the American Neurogastroenterology and Motility. Uh, I'm not sure how much fun they'd be to hang out with, but I'm happy for them that they came up with a universal or standardized gastric emptying uh, table here. Uh, 
uh, fairly recently, in 2007, and University Hospital formally and, and officially adopted this on January 1st of this year, 2011. So basically what's nice is that, that all the patients that are being worked up for gastroparesis now, at university at least, are getting this four-hour study, and obviously you would assume that the more data the better, uh, but it certainly is a more robust NUCMED study than some of the, the one or even two-hour studies. So here are the lower limits of normal, and here are the upper limits or upper limits of normals. In other words, uh, the most you should ever have in your stomach after an hour is 90%. Anything above that is going to be considered abnormal. If you're anything above 60% at two hours, above 30% at three, and above 10% at four, you're going to be considered abnormal and carry with you the diagnosis of gastroparesis. So uh, again, AccuChecks every hour to correlate blood sugar levels, particularly in diabetics, with their rate of emptying. Oh, here we go. What do you suffer from if you have an intense fear of Halloween? Is it halophobia, ghostphobia, samhainphobia, party city phobia, or serenic phobia? Serenic phobia. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll give you a, a sucker for that since it's technically true. <laughs> I don't even know how to pronounce it, but that's the, that's the phobia. Uh, all right, gastroparesis, medical management. Uh, so there's several different types of drugs or classes, prokinetics, antiemetics, and then uh, motility agents or agonists. In the prokinetic group, Reglan is basically the only one that's still left and still available in the U.S. Uh, it has a horrible side effect profile. Uh, a lot of our patients that come to us are already on Reglan. Most of the time it doesn't even work for them. Uh, in a lot of cases, it's just ineffective. Uh, they can get uh, uh, pyramidal side effects, tardive dyskinesia, clonus, uh, spasms, all kinds of extra pyramidal symptoms, all kinds of problems. Cisapride uh, was very, actually very effective at improving uh, gastric emptying. It was even shown to objectively improve emptying. Unfortunately, it had some fairly nasty side effects, particularly uh, cardiac arrhythmias and valvular abnormalities, uh, and the FDA pulled it from the market, so you can't get it in the U.S. Um, Antiemetics uh, are expensive and highly addictive. Almost all the patients come in on some type of anti-nausea medication. Uh, I've seen patients on, you know, literally four to eight milligrams of Zofran every six hours. I mean, these patients are topped out on their antiemetics. Uh, domperidone is useful, uh, but if you take too much of it, you'll increase prolactin levels in the body, uh, particularly in men, that can be a problem. Uh, and medicinal marijuana, only in California, apparently. Uh, and the modal agonists, some patients have tried erythromycin at a lower uh, oral dose and had some response. Unfortunately, it's, the IV route is more effective, but obviously that's not particularly practical as an outpatient. So uh, if I had to summarize gastroparesis medically, uh, it's expensive. There are side effects and safety concerns associated with the meds. They're really aimed just at controlling symptoms, not the disease itself, and they're largely ineffective. So boo, thumbs down. All right, so intrapyloric botulinum toxin A, or Botox injection, uh, I guess they got really bored out in uh, Hollywood and figured where else can we use this drug. But uh, the medical thought behind it was that pyelorospasm is, is felt to be at least a potentially a causative agent in some of the patients with gastroparesis. Uh, for those patients who were unfortunate enough to have undergone anteroduodenal manometry, there has been shown to be an increase in so the tone of the pyloric muscle and an increase in the phasic contractions of the anteropyloric channel. And that was thought to be a potential cause of agent behind the relative obstruction or lack of emptying in, the, in that region. So Botox was able to be used off-label um, initially by the FDA and when what's referred to as these open-label studies uh, where they're just injecting it basically as a potential treatment for a disorder. And they found some symptomatic improvement early on. Uh, about half the patients did report less nausea, less vomiting. Uh, the typical vomiting, nausea, and, and uh, uh, physical comfort scores were improved. The gastric gift improvements were actually mild when they put them in the, the Nuke Med objective test, that they really weren't improving their emptying that much. Uh, but probably most importantly and significantly, and certainly not surprisingly, is that just like Botox in the face, it doesn't last forever. So. Uh, there were plenty of studies done on it. Eventually, they got down to multiple or multi-center prospective randomized uh, placebo-controlled trials to really see what the impact of the medication was. Uh, only 63 patients enrolled, and of those 63 they got enrolled, 
really only 27 or 43 percent uh, had any response to the therapy at all, which is pretty bad. Uh, and, and really the response was short-lived. We're talking four weeks uh, when they measured their nausea and vomiting scores. Uh, it really started to get back to baseline after about a month. Uh, men were tend to be more responsive to the injections than the women. I'm not sure why that is. Uh, and uh, if you were a problem, had a big problem vomiting, if that was your most predominant symptom, you actually had a little bit more relief. Uh, and overall, the mean duration was only five months. Uh, and when you consider the cost and the fact that it would be hard to advocate or recommend getting Botox two or three times a year for indefinitely in the pylorus, most people have abandoned this. Um, and whether or not it can predict your response to pyloroplasty, I'll talk about that in a second, but uh, not clear. It's certainly a question up for discussion. So uh, not surprisingly, these patients are malnourished or uh, feel the need to constantly bloat or vent their stomach. A lot of them come to us either needing uh, some type of feeding access or already in place. Uh, the bottom line is G tube or a PEG is, is a, certainly an option in almost all these patients, but it's important to know it's really just used for venting. It's intended to help reduce the volume of their emesis, uh, as sad as that is. Uh, but you can't feed them because obviously the food sits in their stomach and they aspirate it. So you can't feed them through a PEG or G tube, just decompress. And so for the ones that are really malnourished, end up with J tubes, uh, or if they've had substantial weight loss from their inability to eat. Uh, I have had to put a few J tubes in patients, but fortunately it's a little bit uh, less common. Uh, and again, we're just putting a Band-Aid on the problem. We're not actually addressing the issue. And as everyone knows, tubes are always associated with problems, leaks, cost of tube feeds, and so on and so forth. So, so I mentioned this antroduodenal manometry. I just put this slide up uh, because I deal with some motility studies uh, for gut surgery when we're talking about doing any reflux procedures and, and peristophageal hernia. But frankly, prior to putting this talk together, I had not heard much about antroduodenal manometry. Uh, and the reason is this. Uh, basically, you can see how sort of complex the catheter is. It's got multiple ports coming off the end of this thing. Uh, and the GI colleagues, when they describe how this is done, we don't do it here. Um, when the GI colleagues describe how it's done, basically, th this catheter only measures changes in pressure across a column of water. So you have to fill up their entire GI tract, basically from ligament metrites all the way up at least to the middle of their stomach. And, and then you have to submerge this catheter. You have to fish it past the pylorus. And literally, they're flopping the patient left and right and having them retch and hold their breath and all this stuff. Uh, and it says it's basically just pure torture to have a patient do this. Uh, the readings aren't that accurate anyway. So it's largely been abandoned. So unfortunately, what might sort of give us some idea is if there's a problem more distally in the antrum of pylorus, uh, the test for that is not worth the effort. Oh, here we go. Another Halloween trivia question. The ancient Celts believe the evil spirits were roving the countryside on Halloween night. Uh, they did this to, to protect themselves. What do they do? Bob for apples, wear masks and costumes, go door to door giving neighborhood treats. They burned candy and fruit. They just drink boatloads of whiskey until they pass out. <laughs> B, masks and costumes, right? All right, we'll talk a little about gastric motility. Uh, it is, uh, yeah, it's about five till eight, so most of our stomachs are awake. Um, so neuromuscular activities of the stomach, basically, I uh, mentioned earlier about the receptive relaxation that's present in the fundus. It's sort of what accommodates or detects what the volume is in your stomach. Uh, there are constant or recurrent peristaltic waves more distally uh, in the body in the antrum, sort of propelling food downstream a little bit here. Uh, into the main chyme or mixing channel of the pylorus and the antrum. Uh, and you do get per true peristaltic waves of the antrum itself. Uh, the main functions of the stomach to are to receive undigested food, uh, to mill the uh, food into chyme in a cool term process referred to as trituration, uh, and then empty the chyme into the duodenum in, at least in theory, a regulated manner via the pyloric sphincter. So uh, I suspect Jason probably covered a little bit of the vagus nerve um, discussion when we talked about peptic ulcer disease recently, but I'll just mention, uh, briefly mention it. So the vagus nerve uh, has a substantial component to gastric acid secretion, as you're probably aware, or if you aren't aware, the absites will make you aware. The, uh, the vagal input mediates uh, the trituration process between the antrum and the pylorus, uh, and therefore, because of that, the vagus really is what uh, regulates emptying of solids. Uh, 
And again, this is all learned from uh, physiology uh, research and experiments in the 50s and 60s in peptic ulcer disease, uh, learning that truncal vagata being necessitated some type of uh, resection or bypass of the antrum pylorus because it would not empty. Uh, in addition to that, the vagus also mediates that receptive relaxation of the fundus, uh, again, regulating the reservoir capacity. And so that's impact on, on the feeling of fullness and the feeling of satiety, that feeling of nauseous and vomiting is, is essential in regards to the vagus. Because you, you see a lot of patients with either vagal nerve interruptions, whether they're true truncals or whether they're incidental vagotomy or vagot nerve injuries, they, they have a serious problem uh, in a lot of cases with chronic nausea, some vomiting, but on top of that, they tend to dump uh, because the emptying of liquids is far accelerated to that of solids, uh, and so they do feel that dumping syndrome, but at the same time, they're nauseous, so it's kind of a miserable feeling. Uh, I won't go too much into the electrophysiology of the stomach in the interest of time, but suffice to understand that there is a pacemaker region of the stomach, uh, and that's just important to understand to distinguish between the pacemaker region and what we are doing with gastric electrical stimulation down here uh, in the body of the stomach. It's understanding it's a separate region uh, and that we're not talking about pacing the stomach at all. So there are pace setter waves, at least three cycles per minute uh, that are constant in the stomach, but then you get plateau and action potentials that actually do initiate peristaltic and uh, distal contraction. So uh, briefly on the kinetics of gastric emptying, there are uh, two phases. There's a lag linear phase and a true linear phase. Uh, in liquids, uh, it's basically a, a linear emptying uh, pattern because it's fairly predictive. And again, it, it is able not to be regulated by the antrum and the pylorus. And so uh, the bottom line is, is for gastric emptying, liquid phase is usually pretty normal, even in patients that do have some element of gastroparesis, even in patients, again, with vagotomies, they tend to empty their liquids uh, at, a, at a more predictable rate. The problem is with solids, there is this lag here for the first hour or so before the rate of solid emptying catches up. In most normal subjects, by uh, one to two hours, the, the emptying of the two are about the same. The problem here is in solid emptying with most gastroparetics, uh, they have a much longer lag phase. And again, here's another uh, representation of it. Uh, it. Essentially, fundic relaxation is an accommodation without necessarily increase in pressure, pressure. So you get that receptive relaxation of the stomach to, to keep the pressure the same. Uh, but it's vagal, vaguely mediated, uh, and the, the trituration process begins in the fundus. So we'll talk a little bit about gastric electrical stimulation because we are putting in the uh, stimulator here at university. So there's three types of stimulations that have been described. Uh, one is true gastric pacing. And again, it's occurring up here more proximal in the stomach. That's sort of the fundus corpus or body junction. Uh, essentially, it is true pacing. It is attempting to identify patients who have lost their three cycles per minute or more uh, gastric pacing activity and basically to reset that baseline rhythm. Uh, but it requires high energy to do that. So there's sequential neural electrical stimulation, which actually physically activates the electrodes to induce contraction. So, so as opposed to changing the pace setting of the stomach, this is actually physically inducing contractions of the distal stomach. Uh, and then the third type of uh, stimulation is the high frequency gastric electrical stimulation, uh, which is the type of stimulation that we use and that we're talking about when we're putting in this gastric electrical stimulator. Uh, and in essence, it doesn't directly affect emptying. Uh, what it does is it somehow controls the autonomic feedback to the nausea and vomiting centers in the brain. They do think it has some type of impact on interrupting these vagal afferents going back up to the brain uh, and therefore regulating their, their nausea and vomiting control centers. So when we're talking about gastric electrical stimulation, we're talking about high frequency gastric electrical stimulation. Uh, the name of the product that's out there on the market that provides this is referred to as the Antera Therapy System uh, from Medtronic. And this is the only device of its kind for uh, gastric electrical stimulation. It was approved in 2000, a little over 10 years ago, by the FDA and was referred to as a humanitarian device exemption. Uh, basically identifying a, a small window or subset where it's been shown medications aren't that effective. Uh, and back in 2000, there really weren't a lot of surgical procedures being offered, sort of emptying procedures in gastrectomies. Uh, and so there appeared to be an opportunity to create some sort of less invasive 
uh, in this case, neuromodulation or stimulation to uh, impact the disease. So it did get exemption in 2000 for that. It falls under the class or category of an implantable neurostimulator uh, or an INS. Uh, and that's how it's billed or coded CPT-wise for Medicare and other, reinsur uh, other insurance companies' reimbursement. But again, it's important to understand it's high frequency but low energy. And basically what that means is it's sending out several cycles per second, uh, but it requires very little energy to do that because the only thing that operates or powers these electrodes is a little battery pack here, uh, which is only about three or four centimeters in size. And that battery pack basically has the last in theory, indefinitely, to supply the electrical stimulation. Truth is, it lasts about seven or eight years. When you're talking about uh, gastric pacing, uh, it's high energy, sort of mid to low frequency. The problem with gastric pacing is because it's high energy, it required a battery pack that would expire literally within a week or two. So that's not practical or feasible to have that kind of pacing in the stomach. So that's why we use this high frequency but low energy pacing. So again, Pacing technically is a misnomer. The company will get all excited if you call it pacing because it's not. Again, this is, this is what we're doing here. This is uh, low energy, high frequency stimulation as opposed to pacing, which again, is, is the frequency is similar to what you see in the body. Um, in this case, three cycles per minute in the stomach, but it requires high energy to do that. So the stimulator that we're placing is up here. So this is just a schematic of what it looks like. Uh, it's placed essentially about 10 centimeters upstream or proximal to the pylorus, and you have two little leads here that are about a centimeter apart, uh, and the two leads are connected to this battery pack, essentially, which supplies the power to provide this, the high-frequency stimulation. And again, a centimeter apart, about 10 centimeters back. Uh, I do most of these laparoscopically, uh, and this is just sort of an outline where the trocars are. They can certainly be done by um, um, open laparotomy as well. So in order for us to get paid and for the patient's insurance company to pay and approve the device, essentially you have to have symptoms usually for at least a year, and some exceptions can be made if they're very symptomatic and have multiple hospital admissions if they're less uh, frequently, or excuse me, have been symptomatic for a little less period of time. But you have to have a documented at least two, preferably four-hour uh, nuclear medicine gastric emptying study that shows uh, gastroparesis. You will obviously have to have failed all the medical options that are available to you. Uh, and then workups to prove out uh, causes of obstruction that are otherwise treatable. So again, you can do it lap or open. This is sort of a typical trocar placement. Uh, this right-hand trocar here is for where you put sutures in the stomach to suture leads into the uh, submucosa, and this particular incision is slightly elongated, maybe a little bit medium laterally to accommodate the subcutaneous pocket uh, for the INS. It's really only about a two or three centimeter incision uh, to stuff the pocket in. It's connected to the leads and then closed. So in terms of data on the gastric electrical stimulator, there's actually a fair amount out there. Uh, not all of it's very conclusive. I'll review some of it briefly uh, before going on to some of the other therapies. So the Worldwide Anti-Vomiting Electrical Stimulation Center, the WAVES uh, study, was about eight years ago, and it was sort of hailed as the study that would bring gastric stimulation uh, to the fore as a major therapy for gastroparesis. Uh, it was a pretty well-designed study, at least initially, randomized control with a sham treatment arm. Uh, you can control the device externally with a simple battery pack by turning the device on or off. You can adjust the frequency and the settings on it. And so they decided to uh, blind patients as to whether or not their device was on or off. And so they cycled them on and cycled them off at differing intervals uh, without letting them know which they were getting. But the problem was is that they weren't getting the results that they had envisioned. And so about 33 patients into the study that was powered for 80, the sponsor, in this case Medtronic, pulled their funding. So they basically only ended up with 33 patients. And even though they did show improvements at six months and a year, uh, like, for example, here are your idiopathics uh, in the middle of the white line. You can see the variability of their uh, vomiting frequency here when the device is off. And even when it's on, there's no real difference there. There was some slight difference seen in the diabetic population. Uh, after 12 months, they did have a decrease in the vomiting frequency. Uh, but again, it, the design of the study was sort of criticized because they changed it after two months to just an open-label observational study uh, when they no longer had funding. So uh, here's the 2.0 version. Uh, same author, basically, McCallum. Uh, Richard McCallum has probably studied and written more about the stimulator than anyone by a mile. Uh, he's certainly the most published in this area as a gastroenterologist. Uh, 
he uh, designed this study where uh, it's kind of an interesting randomization process, but basically they got the device, they put them on for six weeks roughly, and then randomized to cycle it on and off at three month intervals and then go back on sort of at the end, for the end of the year uh, to see what's happening with these patients. So they, they focused on diabetics. They, uh, that was part of their inclusion criteria. They eliminated the idiopathics and Parkinson's and some of these other causes. They just wanted to focus on the diabetic population. Uh, they did see a sustained reduction in weekly vomiting frequency, but sort of the, the Achilles heel of the study is there was no difference uh, in vomiting frequency when the device was on versus when it was off. So you could interpret that as, yeah, it's working, but when you turn it off, they're still getting reduction in their nausea and vomiting frequency. It, that's not easy to explain other than there's probably some type of placebo effect present for having a device implanted in your subcutaneous tissues that you think is providing stimulation to your stomach. That may have something to do with it. But it, it, there was clear improvements over a year in the weekly vomiting frequency. I mean, look, just think about that for a second. 19.5 times per week they're throwing up. I don't think I've thrown up 20 times in my life, to be honest with you. Imagine doing it once a year it makes me miserable to think about it. They're doing it 20 times a week. That's just horrendous. Uh, and when they're down to four and a half times a week, they're having little uh, gastroparesis parties, I think. So uh, more info on gastric stimulation. Uh, here's McCallum's personal series. Uh, I think it's over about 10 years, uh, actually 11 or 12 years. 221 patients with a long-term follow-up, average almost six years. Uh, the majority, over half, are showing reduction in their severity of symptoms. Uh, and again, they're seeing most of the benefit in diabetics and the least amount of benefit in the idiopathics, uh, which I do think is interesting given a guy with this degree and volume of experience, again, by far more than anyone else out there. Uh, and basically the conclusions were the biggest significant improvement or best reduction is in the frequency of nausea and vomiting. It's least effective for the feeling of bloating and particular pain. Uh, and most patients, uh, again, coming in on chronic narcotics, even after the stimulator, they're still on narcotics. So it, this is just a, a graph of that study uh, that shows you the difference between, as Dr. Perry would like to mention, uh, statistical significance and clinical significance. So you see uh, two-hour and four-hour nuke med emptying times uh, show improvements with such a large N uh, going from 37% uh, retention pre-op to 30% retention uh, after in therapy at, at uh, the four-hour emptying. But that's still not normal, and it's not even close. If you remember, the four-hour value to be a normalized control is less than 10%. They're nowhere even close to that. So it's not like it's normalizing their emptying. It's just a little better than it was before they got the stimulator. Uh, and again, so these are sort of relative improvements. Uh, so there was a meta-analysis done. It was just uh, very recently published. Uh, only 13 studies qualified for this particular meta-analysis. Uh, and there, of the 13, only one was a true randomized controlled clinical trial, and it was the WAVES trial, uh, which I just alluded to and has its uh, issues and weaknesses. So all the other studies didn't have a control group. They had a treatment group only. Uh, but uh, So here were the findings of the uh, meta-analysis. Uh, so you, you did see improvements in gastric emptying time. This is change or improvement in the two and four hour. So here's your mean change or mean improvement. It's only about 25% better. Uh, in the two-hour here in the four-hour study, again, about 15, 20 percent improvement uh, over uh, pre-implantation or baseline. But again, if you're already having horribly delayed emptying, this is not normalizing, it's just improving. Uh, the improvements in the nausea and vomiting scores were the most consistently observed uh, symptom control improvement finding. Uh, again, a reduction in a score of, of two points, that's a significant reduction because it's a Likert scale from one to five. So they are getting substantial reductions in nausea and vomiting. Uh, and being able to be weaned off J-tube feedings or TPN, uh, another nice benefit of the stimulator, uh, a pretty consistent improvement in their ability to get off supplemental nutrition. So as with any uh, device or product, the Intera certainly has issues. As I alluded to, it's only available as a humanitarian exemption. Basically what that means to you and I is that you have to have IRB approval to put this device in. So we have an open IRB at the University Hospital. Uh, it has to be renewed every year. You have to report on any complications. You have to submit adverse event reports, things like that. Uh, and right now, San Antonio, there's only two institutions that have an IRB that allow us to put the stimulator in. We're one of them. Uh, in Methodist, Maine, uh, I think Russ Woodard is the surgeon doing them there, is the other. Uh, so 
plus the, the cost, uh, in, in addition to just the IRB, limits patient access to the device. Uh, a lot of hospitals, you know, certainly don't want to buy it if they don't think they're going to get reimbursed for it. Uh, the device, again, the battery changed about every seven or eight years, which isn't bad uh, in the picture of implantable neurostimulators. But if you need an MRI for any reason, you actually have to go to the OR and have your battery pack removed physically and then put back in after MRI. That's kind of a pain, but I guess a minor hiccup. Uh, there is significant complications associated with the device. Uh, reading about some of these studies, infection is a big problem in that subcutaneous pocket, particularly in diabetics, not surprisingly. Uh, a lot of patients will complain of that shock sensation, you know, when you drag your feet on the carpet and hit some metal, that kind of shock, right in the lateral abdominal wall. Uh, reports of leads pulling through the uh, seromuscular area of the stomach and migrating. They, they go distally. They go into other areas of the bowel. Uh, and there's even been isolated case reports of bowel obstruction with intestine getting looped around the leads inside the abdomen. So, summary of gastric stimulation, it appears to reduce frequency of nausea and vomiting, and it does improve gastric emptying and glucose control, and therefore nutritional outcomes, but again, it doesn't normalize emptying, it doesn't pace, it's not in training or, or recruiting slow waves, this is high frequency stimulation, uh, and again, the mechanism not very well understood, uh, somehow those vagal afferents are interrupted, uh, sort of disrupting the signal to the brain about that feeling of fullness and early satiety. Uh, and there may be an issue with uh, a change in the gastric tone to allow it to accommodate more food and not get those same symptoms. Ooh, I wonder if I could get my song up. Well, all right. The hit song Monster Mash, 1962 tune by which of the following groups? Bobby Boris, Pickett and the Crip Kickers, Lord Paul Bear and the Grave Diggers, David Dr. Livingstone, the Tomb Raider, Sir Jack Lan and the Pumpkin Smasher, or Burning Basil Pruitt and the Witch Doctors? <laughs> Anyone? It's A. Serenic got that one. That's when you were a teenager. <laughs> Something like that. All right, so on to gastric emptying and some of the procedures that we see associated with gastric emptying. Uh, most of it originated, as we uh, mentioned earlier, from peptic ulcer disease, truncal vagotomies, uh, thus requiring uh, emptying procedures or in patients with gastric outlet obstructions for other reasons, uh, either bypass uh, or section in gastrojejunostomy or pyloroplasty, again, depending on the cause. Uh, but using gastric emptying procedures as primary therapy for gastroparesis or for a true emptying disorder, that there really is not much out there. Uh, again, most of the publications and textbooks are all about peptic ulcer disease and obstruction and things of that nature, but for actual motility disorders of the stomach, uh, limited data. So pyloroplasty, uh, there's three types that were, were taught and have seen basically the Heineke mucolates, Jabaway and Finney. So the Heineke mucolates is probably the most common one. Uh, it's the one most common I've seen and done. Uh, it's making an incision uh, across the pylorus, usually about two centimeters proximal and two centimeters distal onto the duodenum, and then closing it in this direction to completely open up uh, the muscular channel uh, between the stomach and the duodenum. Uh, it's probably the technically easiest to perform. A jab away is a gastroduodenostomy where you make the incision along the distal stomach and the duodenum and just bring them together as a true gastroduodenostomy. And the finny uh, basically is where you make the incision across the whole pylorus and duodenum and make a complex anastomosis. As uh, one of my attendings used to say, finish the cut was uh, what the finny was. So those are the three types of pyloroplasties technically. Uh, they're done laparoscopically in a lot of cases now. Uh, most of the publications on pyloroplasty, whether it's lap or open, again, associated with other procedures, peptic ulcer disease, uh, now the esophagectomies that are being done, most uh, surgeons are doing pyloroplasties as part of their gastric conduit uh, to improve emptying in patients with esophagectomy. Uh, it's been well publicized in the pediatric antireflux patient population how common it is to need a gastric emptying procedure with Nissen's. In adults, maybe not as much unless they have really severe emptying. Uh, laparoscopically, we do the Heineke mucolates because it's the easiest to perform technically. Uh, use a harmonic scalpel to go across the, the stomach and duodenum. Uh, and as long as you are good at intracorporeal suturing and knot tying, this technically is not a difficult procedure. Uh, and now it's being used as a primary therapy for gastroparesis. So I was pleased to see this because Lee Swanstrom is uh, really well respected and, and fairly high regarded in SAGES, which is uh, one of the main minimally invasive surgery societies. And he just recently published his own sort of series 
of treating patients with gastroparesis with pyeloroplasty. Uh, the majority of it was laparoscopic. Uh, they did do two true endoscopic pyeloroplasties where they put a, a circular EEA staple and did a gastroduodenostomy with the EEA staple endoscopically. But for the most part, these were laparoscopic pyeloroplasties. Uh, they did the Heineke uh, Mikulitz technique, uh, and they showed significant reduction in symptoms. So you can see here from pre to post, uh, these are drastic reductions in nausea, vomiting, bloating, reflux symptoms, even pain, which is uh, significant, because again, pain is tough to improve in these patients. Uh, but again, what he thought was most significant is that their half emptying times, again, these were not the four hour studies, but these were half emptying times, improved significantly, but normalized in almost two thirds or three fourths of patients which is much better than what you were typically seeing in, in stimulation patients. The problem is these were very short-term follow-ups, just in the one to three months range. This was not a long-term follow-up study, just sort of a retrospective look of 28 patients. But improvements in symptoms and in emptying objectively, uh, that is encouraging. Uh, so the last resort for treatment of any major disorder of the stomach, uh, gastrectomy, literally it's cutting the tree off at the trunk, as they say. And again, reserved for extreme cases and total treatment failures. Uh, it's either a total or a subtotal gastrectomy in most cases. Uh, the bottom line is you have to remove all the body, antrum and pylorus. How much of the fundus or cardia you leave, it's, it's sort of a relative uh, judgment call. Uh, but the majority of the reconstructions are ruin Y uh, to reduce the risk of alkaline reflux. Um, and gastrogenostomies that are that high up technically might be a little bit more on tension than a true root limb. So uh, the problem with gastrectomies is that they have a high morbidity even in benign disease. Uh, you see it for, for lung disease and understand how sick a lot of these patients are. But even for benign disease, these uh, gastrectomies are, are morbid procedures. Uh, and I've seen them myself in, in uh, trochal vagotomy and, and uh, vagus nerve injury cases. Uh, so here's a review of uh, completion gastrectomy in a series of 62 patients at the Mayo Clinic. These were all post-surgical gastroparetics uh, with good long-term follow-up, usually uh, four and five years in some cases. Uh, and there's this VISIC grading scale of uh, it's a quality of life and GI symptom error, symptomatic questionnaire. So their VISIC scores got better after their gastrectomy. We're more ended up in the group one and two range and, and very few in the three and four range. Uh, what I do thought, excuse me, think is significant is that the percentage of patients that retained these bad symptoms, 48% retained pain, uh, a lot of them on narcotics, they still have dump. Uh, they, they still have a lot of problems. They don't completely go away with gastrectomy. Uh, here's another review of completion gastrectomies with post-surgical gastric acne. And same findings is that there are drastic improvements in all these sort of subjective uh, questionnaire type symptoms. But overall, these are a percent that are retaining those symptoms still. So again, the diarrhea, postprandial fullness, early satiety, they still have it. Um, but it's better in some cases. Uh, so I wish I were like Bones McCoy, uh, treating these gastroparetics with my magic little uh, device here, but uh, actually I'm not, and my Halloween costume suggests this is what I really feel like. Uh, so just in the last year and 10 months or whatever it's been, I've just sort of started keeping track of the gastroparetics that I've treated. The majority of mine happen to be diabetics. Um, those numbers don't add up. I think there's uh, four idiopathics. But uh, five underwent the stimulator device, and two basically got no improvement whatsoever. They were in the ER just as frequently. They were in the clinic puking, uh, readmitted, and essentially no improvement. They were both diabetic patients, uh, but there were three that have had some significant response to the stimulator. Uh, I've done a couple pyloroplasties, usually with a decompressing peg, and I did have one patient who's a diabetic who basically got very re little relief, maybe f reduced the frequency of ER visits from once a week to once a month, but he's still symptomatic and, and miserable, and he's getting a stimulator uh, later on in the month, I think. Uh, and then I've done a couple gastrectomies. Uh, one uh, young lady with a failed stimulator device and a patient with vagotomy from 30, 40 years ago, She's no more happy than she is now, uh, than she was before surgery, uh, and I just say these patients are all sort of equally miserable. So, uh, what is this thing? What is it? Is it a serenic, a swiss? Is it a sickle? Which is what I thought it was. It's a scythe. That's the real thing, too. <laughs> 
Uh, all right, so overall, it remains a medical disease, uh, and multiple surgical options are available between stimulation, uh, some type of emptying procedure, feeding access, or even gastrectomy. There's no head-to-head -head studies to really give me any idea which one is better or, or best or which one's needed when, and there's no sort of defined treatment algorithm. These patients just sort of get sent to us, uh, and they're sitting in, sitting in your office chair uh, with, the, with the dog guys looking at you, looking for help. Uh, and I'm not sure what the right thing to do for them is. Um, do the idiopathics, maybe they're better off getting pyloroplasty first, uh, with or without a peg tube or a feeding tube, and if that fails, they get stimulation. They get diabetics, need a shot at stimulation first, and then pyloroplasty. The, the good news about pyloroplasty and stimulation is they aren't burning any bridges. Now that, on the other hand, that's taking like some C4 and blowing the bridge to kingdom come. So if you do a pyloral classing on a patient, you can still implant a stimulator in them and vice versa. So uh, again, I, I think this is a, it's an unknown, it, you know, it might be an opportunity for some uh, clinical exploration. My personal bias is I think I or we are uniquely situated um, in this particular uh, clinical problem because we have a large group of patients, the Texas Diabetes Institute, uh, the obesity epidemic, it's not going away, it's only getting worse. Uh, our nuclear medicine department uh, is mature, Dr. Phillips, Bill Phillips, uh, basically his area of interest is gastric emptying disorders. Uh, and so we have the standardized four hour study with AccuCheX. Again, we're only two hospitals in the city that pl implant the device stimulator. Uh, and now all the surgical options can be done, uh, minimally invasive laparoscopy uh, or even endoscopically. Um, so as the title of my talk suggested, I refer to gastroparesis as a frightful and spooktacular disease. Uh, how miserable these patients are, vomiting 20 times a week. Are you kidding me? That's just horrible. Uh, it's only getting more common. It's, there's no cure for the disease. Uh, most of the medical and, pharma and pharmaceutical options fail or are poor options. Uh, we've had multiple whiffs at the plate uh, with some of these therapies. Uh, and, and even if you take out their whole stomach, that isn't getting rid of their symptoms in a lot of cases. In a lot of cases. Uh, so in that regard, the, the magic potion is still out there. So the real reason I cooked up Halloween trivia slides to get you in the spirit, I'll show you wear this outrageous outfit. Genuine desire to expand your knowledge. I enjoy throwing candy at people, which I do, or I needed extra slides to fill up the whole hour. <laughs> uh, so I, I saw this, and I want to put that as a cute gastroparesis. <laughs> I would hope that none of you guys come down with that. And then this is my favorite right there. That's, that's quality right there. <laughs> When we were at the recruiting dinner with Dr. Van Sickle and he was interested in foregut surgery, Dr. Swesson and I looked at each other and we thought, we're going to get rid of those nutso, GERD patients and gastroparesis patients, and we're happy that you're here. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> that, great luck. that was a great talk. Uh, with laparoscopic ruin wide bypass, the make them skinny surgery, with that being so common, how come that's not an option? It is. Uh, so the, the dilemma is what to do with the remnant. Okay, so if you have a patient that is really gastroparetic and they have a really prolonged four-hour emptying time where 60, 70, 80, 90 percent is still retained in four hours, if you do a bypass, you will definitely bypass the problem. The food will go down. The issue is what to do with the remnant. So there's no consensus on what to do with that. You can uh, just leave it alone, and when they lose the weight, they'll lose the diabetes, and the gastroparesis gets better. That's one school. Another is you can put a gastrostomy tube in it and just vent the remnant, or you can just take it out and do a, a ruin y bypass with remnant gastrectomy. And there's no consensus statement on it. I, I've done the ruin y with remnant gastrectomy, uh, and the patient did fine. But there are plenty of people out there that have considered doing the bypass if the diabetes onset is early. So a, a recent onset diabetic to us is anyone that's been diabetic for two years or less. It would be unusual, but we are seeing patients with gastroparesis that are recent onset diabetics. Those patients should be able to get away with the bypass only, and then their gastroparesis should get better as they lose the weight. The ones that are longstanding, particularly type 1 diabetics, I, I would feel concerned about if you leave the remnant in there, they're still going to bloat and feel like they have to throw up. Now they got nowhere for that food to go uh, other than blowing out a staple line or something. So uh, in those cases, I think remnant gastrectomy might be the better option.
Yeah, Brian. <laughs> Working on the other end, uh, we see you know we see the chronic constipation folks. How how much do you look for panenteric dysmotility when you're looking at these folks? I, I don't look for it. There are uh, small bowel transit time studies that a lot of the GI docs will get with this. And there is a, there's a pretty strong correlation with abnormal gastric and abnormal small bowel motility studies. It, I, I think the big picture is it doesn't really change what we can or should be able to do for them overall. But the, the small bowel motility problem, I, I guess I've seen fewer of those. That also have the chronic constipation and documented small bowel motility disorders. I, I don't I haven't had to operate on one of those. Aren't one of my eleven? So maybe they're being hoarded, or or the GI folks are fan of doctors telling them there's really no hope for them. I don't I don't know, but fortunately I've not seen that combo. Dr. Swessinger, seems like there might be an indication for a sleeve gastrectomy in in these folks. Anybody uh, explored that? Yeah, uh, I think. Gagne, one of the ones that sort of uh, sort of accidentally discovered the sleeve, did demonstrate on post-op sleeve gastrectomy patients with nuke med studies their gastric emptying was accelerated. So sleeve gastrectomy, not surprising, when you're really tubularizing the stomach, uh, it accelerates gastric emptying. For, for food and liquids. For both. both, yeah. These were solid and liquid phase meals. Uh, I, I think. People probably are just a little maybe afraid to do that. I, that's actually a question uh, uh, Fenton and Rich Peterson and I had discussed very recently as to doing a sleeve gastrectomy for the, like the morbidly obese patient with gastroparesis. It's not been published, uh, so you don't know if you if you ought to be trying that. I think it's reasonable. Uh, I think you also run the risk though uh, of, of getting a problem where if it doesn't work then you're creating a bigger problem where they're vomiting through a, a small sleeve and so they're going to get a higher projectile vomiting. Uh, if you trim too close to the antrum, they may not empty at all. You may make it worse. So it's certainly a thought. I haven't seen it. Historically, the surgical treatment for this was kind of like the fempop, you know, where you just progressed to an amputation. And so the first was the pyloroplasty, <laughs> then a hemigastrectomy, then a just a little bit of a gastric remnant just because people didn't want to suture to the esophagus and then eventually mm -hmm. the total gastrectomy. Uh, there were very few patients where we had to take them to the total gastrectomy, but you know, the, the recalcitrant patients like you see. Yeah. Historically, when we had diabetics with peptic ulcer disease, what we tried to do uh, was to do a pyloroplasty and a highly selective vagotomy and leave the nerve of letter J intact, hoping that mm -hmm. that was going to take care of it. Um, I disagree with one thing you said about uh, erythromycin. Um, Carrie Page and Rich Andresi were the gurus of feeding catheter J. genostomies. In the heyday of gastric surgery, we usually put in a feeding catheter J. genostomy. And we found that the liquid erythromycin through the feeding catheter actually worked, hmm. as well as giving it intravenously. And so there were people that we could get out of the hospital with that. Uh, it was kind of disappointing. Uh, the Japanese were supposed to come up with a synthetic uh, erythromycin that was not a gastric irritant, uh, but it never, uh, it never matured. And I thought there was supposed to be one drug that was supposed to be out there to replace Cisopride. Cisopride. What is it? Mosopride. But it's got the same cardiac problem. <laughs> And what is it, instant uh, death arrhythmia? Or torsan. <laughs> torsan, yeah. Torsan. Mm -hmm. when, when mixed with other things, with other medications in particular, it, it, uh, it precipitates torsan, which can be a fatal dysrhythmia. Not good. Okay. Gastric emptying and being alive, much better. Any other questions? Thank you, Dr. Van Sickle. <laughs>